Now we're going on to a, a, a new topic, which is recurrent neural networks. So like convolutional neural networks were used for, for modeling images, recurrent neural networks are used for modeling sequences, data that are, arise as sequences. So here's some examples. So documents are sequences of words and their relative positions have meaning. So the bag of words model, we didn't take the order of the words into account, right? It was just a bag of which words were used, no matter where they occurred. Here we want to take the sequence of words into account and the order. Well, time series such as weather data or financial indices, those are sequences. Recorded speech or music is a sequence, sequence of notes or phonemes. Handwriting, such as a doctor's notes, is, is a sequence, okay? So RNNs, that's the abbreviation for recurrent neural networks, they build models that take into account the sequential nature of the data. And in doing so, they build a memory of the past. Just to get into notation, so the feature for each observation here is a sequence of vectors. And the sequence is of length L here. And so X1, X2 up to XL, each of these are vectors of numbers. So it's just like an input feature vector, but now we've got a sequence of them. The target Y is often of the usual kind, e.g. a single variable such as sentiment for the whole document. Or perhaps a one hot vector for a multi-class classification task. Okay, but it, it's just a single response. However, Y can also be a sequence, such as the same document in a different language when you want to do language translation. It's a more difficult case. We're going to deal with the simple case and, and work with the sentiment example first. So here's, here's a simple recurrent neural network architecture diagram. And we showed first in this abbreviated form and you can see there's like a cycle going on, which emphasizes the recurrent nature. But then we represent it as a sequence. So here you've got your input sequence, x1, x2, x3, all the way till xl. And as you're going to see, we're going to treat each of our observations as sequences of the same length. And if they're not, for, for whatever reasons, the same length, we're going to force them to be the same length. In, 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 the, in what we do here. Um, but there's versions that don't need that. Now, along with the input sequence, you've got a hidden layer sequence. So these are activations just like we had before, but they march along in step with the input sequence. So there's A1, A2 up to AL. In this diagram, each of these A's are also a vector. X1 is a vector of input numbers at this first point in the sequence. A1 is going to be a vector, maybe a different size, of activation units at this first step in the sequence. And they all feed into each other or move along with the sequence. Now you've got weights. So you, let's look at the weight set, for example, goes into A2. You get, you get input into A2 from X2. That's the corresponding element of the input sequence. And you also get input into A2 from the previous hidden vector, A1. So A2 gets input from A1 and, and X2. A3 gets input from X3 and A2. And so what you can see is that these A's are somehow accumulating a memory of what's happened in, in the sequence. The memory part is carried forward by these A's and you update the memory by getting the memory from the previous step and augmenting the information from the next input uh, vector in the sequence. And that gives you A3. The other thing here is that you'll notice is that the same weights are used at each of these steps as we move along. And that's where the name recurrent comes from. The same weights. So a single set of weights, W going from the input vector to the, to the hidden unit, and the same weights U going from the previous 
activation vector to the current activation vector. We also show in an output set of output units. And again, the same weights go from the, the hidden unit to the output unit. See, these are known as Bs. And that means we can actually measure an output at each step along the sequence. But we're typically interested in the accumulated knowledge of the output, and so we're only interested in the last one, which in this case is, is Y. But there are applications where you, you could be interested in all of them. So here are the parameters that need to be learned are B, U, and W. So here's some more detail. Suppose the elf element of the sequence has P numbers, P components, right? Remember, each input vector in the is a vector in the sequence, and let's say it's got P components. And let's suppose each hidden unit in that sequence of hidden units has got K components. Then the computation of the kth components of the hidden units AL is given by this expression. So there's a, a bias or intercept. Then there's a linear combination of the p-values of the input vector at that point L, and then a linear combination of the activation units at the previous step. And then there's a nonlinearity, such as ReLU. Okay. And then the output layer, for example, is just a linear model. Right? Or if it's a classification, it will be a softmax or logistic transform. And as we said, we, we often only concerned with the prediction OL at the end of the sequence, right? This guy. For example, sentiment of the document. So I just want to ask, go back to the picture. So yeah. if, I guess we can see how it's different than the bag of words we did earlier and that because of the ordering is definitely taken into account. Right? Yes, you're right. And if we didn't have those, those U's that move from one unit to the next, would it, would it be the same as a bag of words? It still wouldn't be the same, Rob. But it would, it would certainly be a, m a much more complex uh, network, but it wouldn't be the same. Okay. So there's, a, there's a, quite a bit of different structure going on here. And I should, we should emphasize this is a, a simple uh, recurrent neural network. You can get more complex ones. For example, you can have two hidden layers. So you'd have, instead of going straight to the output layer, you could have another layer of, of hidden units, a sequence. Right? So this sequence would be input to the next sequence hmm. in a fairly obvious way. And there's lots of other ways you can make this more general. So if you look at the loss that we're trying to minimize, if we're only interested in a, in a, a response from the, the last layer, this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the observed response minus the output from the last hidden unit, right? summed over observations from 1 to n. Say we're using squared error loss. And if we expand that out, you'll see all the weights that we need to learn. There's the betas, which comprise that B matrix of weights. So remember, there were weights B, U, and W. These are typically matrices of weights, right, that have to be learned. And they're the same throughout here. So there's the Bs, there's the Ws, there's the Us. But this loss only involves the activation at point L minus 1 in the sequence. So what about all the other guys? Well, the thing is, these A's are defined recursively. Right? So the A at, at layer L minus 1 depends on the A at layer L minus 2, and so on, it goes back. So when you, when you come to estimate the parameters, you have to take all the steps in the sequence into account. We're going to use an RNN on the IMDB reviews as opposed to the bag of words model. So now the document feature is a, is a sequence of words. Let's call them WL from 1 to L. And we typically pad the documents to the same number of words. So here we're going to use the first 500 words in the document. If it's longer than 500 words, and if it's less, we'll just truncate and pad with blanks up to 500. So now we need some way to represent each word as a vector. Well, we're going to use a one-hot encoded binary vector, dummy variable of length 10,000. And that may seem crazy. That's a vector of length 10,000, and all the entries are zero except one corresponding to the position of that word in the dictionary. 
So that's a very sparse feature vector. And we got one of those at each of the 500 steps in, in, in the document. So this is extremely sparse. What we tend to use is a much lower dimensional pre-trained word embedding matrix. And I'm going to show you a picture of that in the next slide. And what this does is reduces the binary feature vector of length 10,000 to a real feature vector of dimension some number m much less than 10k, like in the low hundreds. So here's the idea. So here's a sequence of words at the bottom. You know, this is one of the best forms, actually, the best I've ever seen. Right. By the way, what we've shown you is the review where we only represent the words in the, in the dictionary of size 10,000. So any additional words have been deleted, and so you don't see them. And so yes, this top image represents a one-hot encoding, right? So this is in, gets a one in this position, and the gray are zeros. Is gets a one in this position, and so on, right? And of course, it's 10,000 high, not whatever number in this picture. Here's the word embedding. And you can see it's a much smaller set of numbers. And they're not just zeros and ones, they're real numbers. So we've depicted them as colors. Right? Maybe a, a, a heat map of colors that goes from blue, which is cold, to red, which is hot, with, with yellows and whatever, and oranges in between. And so now where do we get this word embedding from, this, this new representation? So you can see whenever we have a have, instead of having this coding, we can use these numbers instead. Well, these word embeddings are pre-trained on very large corpora of documents, and they use methods similar to principal components to come up with this lower dimensional representation. And they're very clever. They take into account things like synonyms. So you have, you know, if you have, uh, you know, have a word like um, male and female or boy and girl, the relative position between them in this representation and king and queen will be somewhat the same. So they take into account this kind of, these kind of um, you know, semantic meanings of words and also synonyms. So two of the well-known um, embeddings are word to vec and glove. And you can just, these are available on the, on the web. You can download them. You decide how many dimensions you want and you just plug it into your network. Okay. So we used an RNN with a word embedding on the reviews data. And after a lot of work, the results are disappointing 76% accuracy. Remember, we got close to 89% accuracy. OK, so then we fit a more exotic re uh, recurrent neural network than the one that we displayed. It's one known as a LSTM, which stands for long and short term memory. And without getting into great detail, yeah, AL receives input both from AL minus one, the previous hidden unit, that's the short-term memory, as well as from a version that reaches further back in time. So you take big steps back in time and, and get an AL back from there as well. Right? So that's the long-term memory. And when you do that, it takes much longer to train. You now get 87% accuracy, which is slightly less than the 88% achieved by Glimnet. It takes a long time to learn. Now, just like in the MNIST data and in the ResNet and all these data uh, bases, these data, the, these uh, IMDB reviews have been used as a benchmark for new RNN architectures. So the best reported result found at the time of writing was around 95%. It's, of course, a much more complex uh, network. Um, if you look in section 10.5.1 of the book, the second edition, you'll see a leader, we'll point to a leaderboard where you can see who's winning the race. And again, subject to, to overfitting and, and over, o overlooking at the data. Now, this is something we've seen pretty often, right? I mean, deep nets have some spectacular successes, but on a lot of problems, they don't do better or even they do worse than simpler methods. Yes. You don't, you don't hear about that very much because it's, it's harder to publish simple things, right? That's right. So just a reminder to... Not only try deep nets and think, uh, fancy methods, but also try simpler methods because they often work as well and they're much simpler to understand. 